Good evening. Um, it's with the greatest pleasure that I... The, the word introduced is the wrong word. Uh, maybe something like welcome back uh, is what I should say to Tony Vidler. Tony is a very old friend of the AA and has always kind of overlooked or looked over its theoretical development since the earliest years of kind of Alvin's uh, directorship. And in that time, he has established himself in the States as what I think is undoubtedly uh, the most important architectural critic and theorist uh, of our generation. Um, Tony, after being at Cambridge, went to Princeton, and perhaps even he will kind of tell you how he was kind of tempted by Peter Eisenman uh, to go to Princeton, who then became a very great scholar uh, of architectural theory and architecture in the 18th century, leading to the book on Ledoux, but whose work, whose lectures and whose seminars and whose interventions uh, were always about also contemporary architecture, always with the odd interruption in the 90s, has regularly been here uh, at the AA, arguing a kind of a reasoning about architecture. I remember him once at a conference uh, in Princeton saying under slightly aggravated con uh, kind of conditions uh, saying to people who were announcing new theoretical positions uh, that were obviously only going to last a season or two, that actually architectural theory was in the business of being there for the long term. That is to say that architectural theory, you know, was not some intellectual celebration of what might go on this year or that year, but had itself a long-term responsibility to think about these movements within architecture. And it's on that basis that I invite you, in a way, to kind of appreciate uh, what he says. It's the product of long thought, the product of having been here many times to represent a position which grows more complex uh, as time goes past, and is now in a kind of architectural condition which we all worry about as to what that condition is. Some people feel jubilant, some people feel despairing, other people feel confused. Uh, Tony always addresses these issues as a problem for architectural theory. And it's in that spirit uh, that he's going to give the course this week on utopia and architecture and this evening's lecture on utopia and architecture. I ask you to welcome Tony Bidler. <laughs> 
Oh, Mark, I, I, I really love Mark because he's actually the only person who ever remembers what I said. You know? <laughs> I never remember having said the great things that Mark attributes to me, and so I always then reattributed them to Mark. So, um, so whatever I said then, you said much better tonight. Thank you. It's my 30th, uh, 30th year at the AA, actually, with a couple of years off in the 90s the 30th public lecture. And uh, as a young Turk, I wish to uh, address you tonight as somebody starting over in his career. Um, some of you will know that I got my PhD two years ago, so I have a long academic career in front of me and another 30 years here, uh, which I regard as my um, home intellectually and socially um, in London, uh, having been exiled from London for uh, more than 30 years, in fact, since 1965, that fatal morning, uh, actually it was the uh, middle of the night because Peter Eisman didn't reckon on the time difference when he called me from the United States, um, woke me up in Cambridge and said, by the way, there's a one-year position available in Princeton, and that was my fate. Since then, I've been there and other places in America ever since. So, as you can see, I've, I've, my first slide is... is uh, a slide of utopia, and um, the rest of the images will be superfluous to this one. The idea of utopia has often been dismissed out of hand, either for its, its totalitarian or its unrealistic implications. Yet I want to begin tonight with one example of an effective or an especially effective use of the genre. Indeed, an example that I believe was the very reason for the invention of the idea of an ideal polis, or rather the fully developed idea of an ideal polis in developed Greek culture. In the year 403 BCE in Athens, the triumphant Democrats succeeded in de defeating the 30 tyrants who had taken control of the city under the guise of restoring responsible rule, something that's happened many times since in Greece and elsewhere. The Democrats, described as an unruly rabble, as they still are, I guess, surging from the Piraeus, armed with an assortment of weapons and with women and children holding everything from staves to cooking implements, had overthrown a military dictatorship in Athens defended by well-trained soldiers. On the eve of their triumph, their orator stated, we will henceforth forget our previous troubles. A forgetting that many historians have proposed, and I refer particularly to the extraordinary work by Nicole Laureau, the French classicist, La Cité Divisée, or The Divided City, a forgetting that many historians have proposed as the real foundation of Greek democracy such as it was. This forgetting we now term a state of stasis, a balance of powers, such that the mathematical counting of votes rather than armed conflicts causes changes in regimes. It was a stasis between two factions of a city that, as all Greeks since Homer had admitted, was a divided city. The divided Greek polis was divided between the city of war, of warriors, defense and offense, and the city of marriage, life and ritual, that of motherhood, child-rearing, propitiating the gods and sacred rites. This divided city, depicted by Homer on the shield of Achilles, was in 403, at least temporarily, brought together under the sign of forgetfulness. But we should remember that the Greeks also translated the word stasis as civil war. And it was a civil war that was brought to a temporary halt by the suspension of memory that was the foundation of democracy. We should remember this today when civil war is raging in many parts of the world from Sri Lanka to Baghdad and when the United States is so intent on imposing democracy on the world, notably in Iraq. Perhaps this explains why the administration has had such a hard time uttering the words civil war in this context. I have a series of uh, of, uh, of moments that uh, I don't have time to go into tonight, which start in the, the end of last summer, uh, where the administration is 
is, is, is not uttering the word civil war, but talks about all kinds of uh, sectarian conflict, maybe civil war, maybe, maybe civil war, maybe, maybe civil war, and we're waiting till a report can tell us that it is civil war, and hey presto, only this month the word civil war was actually uttered by President Bush. A country in the throes of a civil war that is not a country ready to embrace the civil forgetness of previous troubles conducive to democracy. But I stray from my subject. The point of this example is to note that it was soon after 403 and the subsequent trial of Socrates by the Democrats and his suicide that Plato began his series of dialogues inquiring into the proper form of the just city, starting with the Republic. Forms that he outlined, I, oh, sorry, forms that he outlined, let's just do this, there's Athens, there's the Piraeus and the Acropolis, the long, mur, which, uh, the long wall which uh, the Democrats stormed up, and then a diagram of uh, Plato's spatialization of politics as assayed in at least one of the, uh, his efforts to develop through discourse the form of the just city and the republic. A form that he outlined according to a mythic and itself totally forgetful image of the past archaic policies, polis, one that would nevertheless serve as an ideal forgetting history and returning to the future with nostalgia that would bind a newly established government to uniting a divided city. I'll return to this critical role for utopia later. But this evening, as part of a four-day seminar course for the master's students here, I want to speak about the concept and architectural implications of utopia, an old subject dating from uh, Thomas More's invention of the term in 1516, and an even older concept as an heir to the debate over the just city from Plato on. But it's a concept that for all its long and imbricated history has taken on today, I believe, a new urgency. Let me be clear. I'm not this evening going to rehearse this long history of ideal societies since Plato or of ideal cities since Philarete. Nor am I going to enter into the equally long debate from Aristotle to Karl Popper that sees utopia and correspondingly ideal cities as the source of totalitarianism, fascism, and according to Adorno and many others, the technological regimes of the concentration camp. Nor finally am I going to resume Marx's own reservations with utopia that have more to do with his need to separate himself from the mid 19th century proliferation of social utopias from Fourier, Saint Simon, Etienne Cabet and Proudhon than to any non-utopianism embodied in his own predictions of the post-revolutionary society. Certainly, utopia has, in the social and political domain, gotten a really bad reputation, and especially in the modern period. Increasingly, as the social and political results of unchecked technological development became clear in the West, utopia lost its sway. And in a way, while the critique of industrial society was a root cause, architecture played its part in undermining the positive values of utopian thinking. As Stalinism took hold in Russia, National Socialism in Germany, and Fascism in Italy, the gloomy pictures of the industrial city painted by architects such as Hilbersheimer of architecture seem conjoined to produce the response from latter-day humanists that, as Colin Rowe, who's my tutor at Cambridge a long time ago, was so fond of saying, the ideal city is a ball. Utopian society would be immensely boring. Joined together, the image is one of profound ennui. <laughs> we can all judge of this by looking at the urban models derived from Siam precedents applied in post-World War II Europe, the Americas, and more recently with devastating impact through the developing world. Examples of slum clearance of center city reconstruction of planned new towns, all of which seem fated to be demolished in their turn by the course of development, social taste, economic failure, and the like. Others saw more sinister effects in the making, confirmed by the atrocities committed in the name of social construction by the Nazis with technological precision. 
Thus, we inherit the utopian tradition with a distinctively bad reputation that utopias gained after the 30s, after Zamiatin's We, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, Orwell's 1984. But Yayev had already summed this negative sense of utopia up in a passage that Huxley cited as an epilogue in the second edition of Brave New World. He wrote, utopias appear to be much more realizable than we used to think. And we now find ourselves faced by a question that is much more disturbing, how to avoid their definite realization. Utopias are realizable, life, life marches towards utopias. And perhaps a new century will begin, a century where the intellectuals and the cultivated class will dream of ways to avoid utopias and return to a non-utopian society, yet less perfect and yet more free. He wrote that in 1940. This, of course, was the burden taken up by Karl Popper. He wrote, the lesson we should learn from Plato is the exact opposite of what he tries to teach us. It is a lesson which must not be forgotten. His own development proves that the therapy he recommended is worse than the evil he tried to combat. That's Popper. And then by Bertrand Russell, Popper's attack on Plato, while unorthodox, is in my opinion thoroughly justified. Or Lewis Mumford, Plato's palace might be described as a walled prison without room for the true activities of the cities within its prison yard, governed by totalitarian controls insulated by secrecy. Utopias in their perfection were in essence totalitarian, he inserted, as asserted as he castigated an ideal that seemed thoroughly aristocratic, Spartan, and ultimately humdrum. Fears of this kind were and still are to be heeded with all seriousness. For an albeit distorted notion of Plato's, Plato's polis is once again on the political agenda, at least in the United States. As Leo Strauss, the Chicago-based German philosopher in exile, whose Spenglerian view of the decline of Western civilization and its values have made him a hero to a quasi-cult of neoconservatives who now serve in the government of George W. Bush. What Ayn Rand was to the circle of George Shultz and Richard Nixon, so Strauss is today for today's neocons. Strauss, however, nuanced his actual readings of Plato, and they were certainly some of the more brilliant in a crowded field, shared with Plato a passionate dislike of democracy. Hitler, after all, had been voted into power democratically, and the mass of Americans, sated with popular culture and media frenzy, could hardly be left to govern themselves wisely. Hence the cult of the big lie, the elite government governing in secret, and Dick Cheney. So strong has been the refusal of utopia and program in the last decades that even to speak on this theme is especially problematic. And certainly in what follows, I don't wish to convey the impression I'm equally uncritical of ideal modernism, especially of the worst developer kind. Far from it. My researches into the Enlightenment world of Ledoux and his successors to the present have all been stimulated by this critical impulse, one shared by many members of Team 10 after the war and by many of my own generation. On the other hand, this critical attitude towards much modern development patterns does not mean that I fall into the trap of a new urbanism or a pastiche postmodernism, both equally prey to false nostalgia and similarly open to the worst vagaries of developer kitsch. So in tackling the question of utopia and its allied programs, I'm neither nostalgic nor uncritical. But I do want to open up once more the question of what I believe to be what has been termed necessary utopia out of the conviction that the present state of urban thought demands more than a skepticism towards grand schemes, more than what has been called a post-critical attitude that seems for all the world to be no less than accommodation to the constraints of the real, more than impossible nostalgia for a cozy past that never existed historically and that does little else than reinforce class, ethnic, and economic divisions to the benefit of those who live in gated communities or in economic bubbles of high income. More finally than the self-indulgent play of supposedly pure aesthetic values that do little for the ethical role of architecture in a society here and now and a world here and now and for the future that is rapidly destroying all social values in a rampant orgy of neo-capitalist development. Rather, I want to take from my text Another important essay of the 1930s, this one by the sociologist Karl Mannheim, written just before the Second World War and in conditions that seemed dangerously close to the totalitarianism that was about to sweep Europe. In his book, Ideology and Utopia, Mannheim argued strongly for the need for ideal thinking 
as opposed to its opposite, the acceptance of the status quo. No ideal thought, he wrote, no change, he wrote. The disappearance of utopia brings about a, sta a static state of affairs in which mankind himself becomes no more than a thing. With the relinquishment of utopias, man would lose his will to shape society and history and thereby his ability to understand it. It's in this spirit then that I'll advance my own sense of the need for a rethinking of utopia in conjunction with its architectural corollary, the ideal city. A sense recently shared by a number of thinkers from the late Cornelius Castoriadis in France to Frederick Jameson and Perry Anderson in the United States who in different ways, Castoriadis reading Plato, Jameson reading Coolhaus, Anderson reading Jameson, have returned to utopian thought as a means of attempting to overcome the impasse raised to critical theory and Marxist critical theory in particular by the collapse of the Berlin Wall and its post-ideological, post-critical aftermath. The problem of rethinking utopia is however compounded by the traditional vision between the proposed social forms narrated by utopias, themselves a primarily literary genre, and the reification of those forms in architectural form, the ideal city. The gradual and often unnoticed translation of utopia into ideal city. The distinction is important but has largely been obscured since the Renaissance. Originally, the two ideas were separate, if not entirely unrelated. The Renaissance ideal city was proposed as a buildable form, from the point of view of defense at least, a matrix for the pieces from palaces to markets sponsored by the new patrons of the, of the Brunelleschis, the Albertis, the Scamozzis. The classical idea of the best polis, or the Renaissance utopia of Moore, on the other hand, was less interested in architecture than exploring alternative social and legal programs to those existing in reality. Moore's name utopia, after all, was precisely nowhere. The maps were lost. The traveler who recounted his experience there was prevented from revealing its position by a cough in the narrative. And while Moore opines that he would want utopos, no place, to become utopos, good place, this was only in the context of the transformation of the utopian island itself. But gradually, after Moore, there emerged, largely as a result of antiquarian research into the sources of classical thought and the idea of progress emerging in the 18th century, a subtle elision between utopia, the literary genre, and the ideal city, the architectural genre. Driven by the equally false elision between ideal platonic form and ideal platonic cities that derived from a partial or hasty reading of the newly translated discourses. Thus all the attributes of Plato's proposed ideal states were too quickly accepted and handed down as the symbols, if not the practical forms, of buildable just cities. Philaretes Sforzinde, Ledoux's ideal city of show, Pemberton's happy colony, Ebenezer Howard's ideal city, garden city, followed by Garnier's Cité Industrielle, Le Corbusier's Ville Contemporaine, Hilbersheimer's Vertical City, and after all this, all the poverty-stricken derivatives that masqueraded for post-war governments as social reform through architectural design. Derivatives that while many were of considerable architectural quality, I speak of the Unité d'Habitation, the LCC housing estates, and the equally unfortunate Pruitt Ego in St. Louis, derivatives that were condemned by social and economic policy to become warehouses for social problems rather than their solution. So in the phrase that my friend Martin Pauli coined in 1974, architecture versus housing, thence the not so far leap to architectural utopia versus society. To trace such a descent in this way is of course not only bad history, but also caricatural of the subject itself. For what it ignores is one, the actual form of the propositions as opposed to their vulgarization through repetition and two, the role 
that such utopias played in their specific historical context. For if we reread the foundational texts of this tradition, and specifically those much, much misunderstood texts of Plato and more, we find not, not only that what posterity has attributed to them is either false, non-existent, or more important, often the opposite, but also that they themselves are far for, from foundational in character. What do we make of a Plato, for example, many of whose dialogues are of dubious authorship, impossible to translate in any settled way, a Plato who never speaks in his own voice, but always ambiguously in the voice of others, many apparently contradictory with his own principles, and he indeed speaks in the voice of a Socrates whose thoughts we only know through the unreliable reportage of a Plato. And what of a supposed ideal city outlined in the Republic, which it turns out takes on at least three different guises before being rejected at the end? Or of the role these inquiries and experiments I have mentioned in logic and idealization played in the time after 403 BC and the victory of the Democrats over the tyrants? Democrats who had forced Socrates himself to commit suicide and Plato himself to take his ideas off the dangerous street and put them in the academy. Or what are we to think of a Thomas More, whose playful invention of the island and society of utopia was part of an elaborate intellectual game played with his friend Erasmus, a reply to Erasmus' own in praise of folly, Moria in Latin and thus dedicated to More. What are we to think of a supposedly serious political tract that treats of a visit to an island called Nisquama or Nowhere once called Abraxa or Heaven, recounted by one Raphael Hithrodeus, well learned in nonsense, with its capital city, Amorotum, ghost or shadowy city, beside the river Anhydrus, without water, whose scholar ambassadors are called Ademus, peopleless, and with a senate that habitually lies, set beside a river without water. And what of the role of Moore's utopia? Well, one only has to read the first book of that much read but ill understood tract to find a direct critique of the society of Henry VIII's England, its governmental and legal corruption, its social poverty as a result of the increasing enclosure of arable lands, the sinks of iniquity of its cities. And a closer look at the description of the ideal island itself would then reveal that the river is suspiciously like the Thames the number of cities suspiciously equal to that of England's counties, and so on and so forth. Thus, utopia as social critique. But also utopia as an experiment outside the boundaries of the real, in inventing other solutions to the real. So I want to concentrate on a second aspect of utopia and its relations to the ideal city, which I think might deserve more recognition and even propose strategies for contemporary experimentation with the concepts, forms, and programs of society and its relations to architecture. What I want to propose in brief is an understanding that privilege is not the ideal form, but the experimental nature of utopian propositions. One that has since Plato, in fact, been quite evident, but largely obscured by the inevitable reification stemming from utopia's translation into architecture. In such a view, the construction of utopia becomes more of a serious game, a strategic hypothesis, or series of them, advanced with a what-if sense. Propositions to be tested and not necessarily immediately built in stone. Thus, we should remember that Plato himself constructs his polyes in the form of a dialogue among a circle of friends around Socrates, the celebrated Socratic discourse, better named the Platonic dialogue. In this narrative of question, answer, hypothesis, and counter thesis, no one single solution necessarily wins. But the attempt is always to work towards the most reasonable compromise among all possible and impossible goals. Often the narrative is forced to turn right back on itself to the beginning, as in Timaeus's description of the origins of the cosmos where at least three, if not four times, he is led to reject his first formulation, his first starting point is inadequate. This happens too in the Republic, 
where Plato tries out three cities in quick succession before settling on his final version, one that he admits in the end may never be built. We get the sense, reading the entirely believable reports of these conversations that Plato Socrates is playing, in the, is playing an elaborate game, both with his subjects and with the reader. A game of strategy that endows each player with a character often based on a model from real life drawn from the family or circle of Plato, or from the politicians and officials of Athens. That this character plays a role that is crucial to the development of a plot, but a plot that has no preconceived end. Rather, one that simply assumes the present condition of the polis is not to be recommended. Socrates, in fact, gives the game away, so to speak, in several passages in the Republic, where he refers to the polis not as the city, ideal or real, but as the commonly known name of a board game. You see it on the screen. And I don't use the word game idly, for a close reading of the Republic reveals that the great source of Plato's or Socrates' dialectical method was indeed drawn from the games of checkers or drafts called generically pateia or polis, played with stones or pesoi on a gridded board that were the common pastime of the Greeks. In fact, Homer depicts the uh, suitors of, uh, of, um, of uh, Odysseus' wife waiting and playing uh, pesoia or polis as they wait. But for Plato, this game is endowed with more significance than a simple pastime. Patea for him is a kind of training ground for thought, a veritable science in its own right. Thus he asked, quote from the Republic, is someone a good and useful partner in the game of Patea or Polis because he's just or because he plays Patea? The answer, someone who plays Patea would be of more use. It's a game that has to be played then from childhood, he says, and not just a sideline. Played on a board and with pieces that reference the formal building blocks of the universe itself, the spheres as described in the Timaeus. A game invented, Socrates tells us, by the same Egyptian divinity who first discovered number and calculation, geometry and astronomy, as well as the game of Patea and above all else, writing. So this game is foundational. It's a game of foundation. It is played with the building blocks of the universe. It is played on a grid, which is, after all, the building block of the Miletian city. <coughs> Equally important, it was the consummate game of strategy. Ajax and Achilles are depicted on vases, playing while at rest from the war. And as Pollux notes, there are two sets of pieces of different colors, each of which is called a dog. The object of the game is with two pieces of the same color to surround and therefore partake a piece of the opposite color. Polybius speaks of Scipio, who destroyed many men without a battle by cutting them off and blockading them, like a clever Patea player. Such a training in strategy is for Plato an example for discourse itself. In the Republic, Socrates is accused of trapping his interlocutors in his indisputable arguments, in the same way, quote, as an inexperienced Patea player are trapped by the experts in the end and can't make a move. In the same way, the philosopher's questioners are also trapped and have nothing to say in this different kind of patea, which is not played with persoi or counters, but with words. Further, Pollock's description of the game played by Ajax and Theseus is advanced in a specific context, as he demonstrates how Theseus merged the different cities of Attica into one large city or polis citing Cratinus proverb, O descendant of Pandion, Theseus king of the fertile polis, you know the one we speak of and you know how they play the dogs to make a polis. And this is the point. For the version of Patea that Plato referred to in the Republic was indeed polis, the city's game, the Greek version of Sim City, one where the strategy of putting two or more cities against each other on the board was a rehearsal for the real game of war. Socrates makes this clear when in the midst of constructing the ideal state, right in the middle of the Republic, he cautions that it's not one state or polis they're speaking of, but in fact many, and notably two, because you can't have one city without another, you can't have one without the other. You ought to speak, he says, of the other polis in the plural. Not one of them is a polis, but many polis, as they say in the game. Each, indeed, will contain no less than two divisions, 
one the policy of the poor, the other of the rich, which are at war with one another and within which there are many smaller polis, all divided up, all divided into factions or stasi. At once game of strategy and skill, science and art, the board game polis is for Plato the very ground on which his ideal cities are constructed, laboriously, move by counter move, polishing the playing as he goes through a relentless dialogue, a game of logic, a game of rational moves, a spatial game, finally, that takes his place on a mental grid, even his Hippodamus had laid out the Piraeus in geometrical sectors, and we have to remember that the dialogue of the Republic actually starts and goes on in the, the newly ordered and organized Piraeus and not in the old Athens center. In this reading of Plato, and especially the Plato who incessantly searches for truth in a never-ending dialogue and an ever-receding rationality, he surely demands a certain sympathy. One that considers the utopian discourse qua discourse as essential for the development of social idealism in any form, materialist or liberal. For Plato, as Hannah Arendt realized, was the first to shift the discourse of philosophy from a plan of action to a process of fabrication. And utopias, however flawed in practice, nevertheless, as she notes, were among the most efficient vehicles to conserve and develop a tradition of political thinking in which consciously or unconsciously the concept of action was interpreted in terms of making and fabrication, the construction of the public space in the image of a fabricated object. Even Carlin Rowe, with his affection for Popperian piecemeal engineering, a forerunner of Collage City, has to admit, with Mannheim, that while he writes, utopia in any developed form in its post-enlightenment form must surely be condemned as a monstrosity, a flagrant sociological or political nightmare, as a reference, as a heuristic device, as an imperfect image of the good society, utopia will and should persist as a possible social metaphor, not a probable social prescription. Castoriadis agrees, for as he admits, while one cannot call Plato totalitarian or make him the father of totalitarianism, and while his hatred of democracy and on account of what constantly shines through from him as a desire to fix the things in the city into place, to put a halt to the evolution of history, to stop self-institution, to suppress self-institution, makes him an obvious target for everything in history that will represent this attitude of everything reactionary and pro-establishment, nevertheless, the enormous element of authentic creation that exists in Plato, creation of an incontestable trans-historical value that's attached to his work, linking at once philosophical depth, logical dialectical power, literary artistry and a savoir-faire in the politics of ideas, also makes him worthy of understanding. If only for the series of operations, Castoriadis concludes, the strategy that he puts into effect. It is with and through this Plato then that I would suggest the real, we read utopias and ideal city models. A Plato whose strategy is as important as his obviously archaic and historically interesting social vision, whose philosophy cannot without enormous anachronism be called totalitarian or fascist. A Plato has to be seen for what Hans Gadamer has termed his supreme irony, his incessant critique of things as they are, of every proposition rational or irrational. A Plato who might not have found the truth of our justice, our happiness, or our rationality. How could he have done? And who was perhaps not the best of urban planners, but nevertheless one whose ability to talk the game of polis has never been surpassed. In looking at utopia as a game of strategy, of testing and refuting hypotheses, we are reminded of the elaborate word games played out between Thomas More, Erasmus, and their circle as they passed their manuscripts back and forth in the construction of their polis. Or the games of Albertus Momus, that most artful of refuseniks, seeking to undermine the glorious plans of Jupiter for an earthly city rivaling that of the gods. Or of Philarete, whose project for a house of virtue and vice on the screen. Or of Rabelais, whose carnivalesque overturning of Plato in his imagined utopia of Telem, where the abbots and monks will all be young and beautiful maidens who will live a life of erotic pleasure and with equally young and beautiful lovers or even of Ledoux, whose equally playful game of social reversal includes the marvelous Oikema, or Little House, a synonym for brothel in the French Petite Maison, modeled, I have to think, on Philarete's House of Virtue and Vice, where the education of a minor is completed by a host of precessors 
initiating him into love, or in the elaborate, elaborate numerologies of a Fourier as he sought mathematical authority for his couplings and triplings between his three sexes and their harmonious relations to vegetables and those sexual relations of the vegetables themselves. Or the myth of a society without hierarchy played, painted by William Morris in News from Nowhere, where the garb of the garbage collector is rated high, the golden dustman, as he's called. Or the visions of world temples so dear to Patrick Geddes in his imagination of a new biopolis, a paradigm that we would do well to pay more attention to. But closer to home, we might note the prolific inventions of urban strategies such as those invented by Guy Debord, whose invention of the game of the derive and its spatial unearthing of the psychology of the modern polis is accompanied by equally elaborate rules. Debord, who following Clausewitz and seeking to hone his expertise in urban strategy and dialectic, invented and built for himself his own polis game that of the Kriegspiel, or war game, the board and pieces of which figured so prominently in his last film with reference to the aerial panning of Paris in Im Girum Imus Nocte et Consumima Igni. We go round in circles in the night and are consumed by fire. We might see this game as played out in Paris with the Derive and the celebrated psychogeographic maps, maps of desire and chance sensation, of passion and ludic inspiration, maps based self-consciously on the equally radical maps of friendship and desire invented by the women's circles of the 16th century, Madeleine de Studeri and the Précieuses whose carte de tendre or map of tenderness inspired so many board games in the next centuries and so many films in the 1950s such as Au Fool's Lola Montez and Louis Mal Les Amants. Or, more directly, we have the example of the proto-situationist filmmaker Albert Lamorice, whose son Pascal hovered between the sordid reality of life in Belleville and the utopia of the heavens populated by sensate balloons. And the triumph of that latter vision in the final scene of 1956, his 1956 film Ballon Rouge, as he ascends over Paris on the strings of the community of balloons. La Maurice, we also remember, was the inventor of a special kind of movie shot from a helicopter, as well as a game of strategy called La Conquête du Monde, later, which he sold to the United States, called Risk. With this in mind, I would want to review not what evil has come from the often monstrous marriage of utopia and the ideal city, but what rather has utopia contributed to architecture since its invention in the Renaissance. What has, to return to my first idea, the utopian program contributed to architectural invention over the centuries, marked by what Tafuri understood as the period of architectural utopia. But where for Tafuri following Marx, utopianism was to be criticized precisely for its idealism and lack of contact with the real world of capitalist political economy, and thereby unsuited to construct a real revolution, I would want for a moment to suspend judgment and simply see utopia as a device for invention and sometimes radical intervention. I think of Archigram, whose arrival on the scene of the AA in the early 60s turned upside down the still very serious commitments of Team 10 to a, rise, to a revised Siam and baited the generations of the Smithsons and Sandy Wilson and Leslie Martin architects of permanence with images of hedonism, hedonism technological futurism, cybernetic and computational communication, infinite flexibility, instability, psychical and physical, and who were among the first to take seriously the optimistic conclusions of Bannum's theory of design that if architects were to take seriously the implications spelled out in the modernist myth of technology rather than symbolizing it in academic forms, an entirely architecture autre or other architecture would emerge not resembling in any way traditional architecture. And although Bannum's own traditionalism got in the way of his theme, his dream had in fact been partially realized by Archigram, he certainly was the first to take serious notice of their work. Or finally, I think of that master of dystopian utopianism, Kulhas, whose early work with Mama virtually reestablished the missing narrative <coughs> utopia single-handedly in The Prisoners, set in London, then in the delirium of a New York that was once New York and not New York, 
but that in retrospect was the foundational program for all the later work. For the assumption of boredom as a necessary attribute of the typical, for the assumption of the typical as a result of a program, for the reinvention of the program in so many different guises, all gently or violently upsetting the programs that had given rise to modernist typologies, whether of villas, of libraries, hotels, or museums. All these examples and more give us hope that a radical utopianism might help us out of the apparent impasse we are faced with in a moment where the newest technologies are used simply, for, simply to reify the need for institutional monumentality and consumer seduction, where the economy is used as a weapon against all social and political reform, where war is once again used to justify the suspension of all liberties, where Plato in Neo-Straussian guise once more raises the ugly head of expediency. Could not a utopian programmatic strategy, such as I have described historically, but now dedicated to our own sense of social justice and to our need to test out the possible environments that might foster it? A strategy for opening up the firmly closed door of architectural and urban conventions, of experimenting without imposing, of the construing the city, our city, not Plato's city or any of the other cities that have been imagined for us, in such a way that its reality, its intransigent existence, might be transformed for the better. Could not the new technologies be researched for the benefit of communities destroyed by war and man-made disasters that in New Orleans, Southern California, and Iraq? Could not architecture once again take up the challenge of Bannum's hope of Archigram's experiments and find itself, as Le Corbusier himself stated, in the telephone as well as in the Parthenon? I see certain moves in the game that are stirrings in this direction. As I observed in a recent piece I called The Expanded Field of Architecture, I see new conceptions of landscape, of material technology, of biological inquiry, of programmatic exploration, all aided by the cybernetic revolution and its powerful analytical tool, the computer. One parallel to the expanded fields of sculpture identified by Rosalind Krauss 20 years ago. This is a hotly contested expansion, both by those who would reverse the clock in the fruitless search for an authentic architecture or architectonics? For what authenticity in history has proved more than provisional, temporary, and relative after all? And by those who are so preoccupied in the intricacies and fascinations of the technologies in themselves, whether as representation or fabrication, that they hesitate to look to the wider social implications of the programs that these technologies might now unleash. I'm confident. For basing my understanding of the role of utopia in history, I believe that we once again find ourselves in a moment where, as Frederick Jameson remarks in his recent book on science fiction as utopia, the world seems so dark and unmovable that the only way out would be to image an immediate future not so dark and not so immutable, to imagine that is a utopia, but as strategy, not as form. Let's work toward that moment, always bearing in mind the dangers inherent in utopian thought by working once more on the program of our architecture, exploring its social and ecological potentials, experimenting con in conclusions as if we were in a utopian laboratory. And of course, here in the AA, we can do this more easily than many practicing architects can do, bound by convention, for what else have the greatest schools of architecture been but laboratories for utopian programs. Thank you. And you might understand that I have no answers to your questions, but simply strategic movements in the game. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. while some guys uh, drink some beers outside. But um, more seriously, I, I heard that you um, have written a book called Warped Space, which I haven't read or haven't looked at, anything like that. I, um, I can resume it in a sentence, if you want. Okay. Well, uh, I was just wondering whether you could talk about, perhaps, um, 
the qualities of cybernetic space or cyberspace, whatever, and how they could perhaps relate to this possibility for a new utopia. Because it seems to me, if you look at Hilbersheimer or some other modernist visions, they're all a perspective or an axonometric, which means that you can draw a line from any point to any point uh, within that field of space. It's kind of a, um, a representation of space which gives you complete control over that uh, abstract space, if you like. Whereas you look at kind of uh, medieval paintings, um, so there's, there's uh, in the, anyway, and, um, or El Greco, for instance, and you see a kind of um, much more swirling, nutty, kind of willful, figurative kind of um, representation of space. And whether um, you feel that cyberspace offers a possibility for a kind of um, escape from this rational, kind of modernist, um, pointillized representation of space, or whether it's um, because it's kind of conceived in, in that era, it's uh, the same thing, just in a computer. Um, I think that the occupation of space of any form is dependent on its relationship to the to the the social conditions it uh, allows for and permits, the ecological conditions uh, that it supports, and the resources that it minimally takes from the planet. Period. And I don't care whether it's warped or straight or up or down, as long as it, uh, m for a moment, uh, suspends the relentless sort of rape of resources, society, and cultures that neocapitalism has launched on the world. And so at a certain point, I'm interested in programs that work in a very small scale, in very small spaces, with very small cultures, to resist certain large-scale globalizing influences. I'm also interested in large-scale programs which, perhaps not financed by the World Bank, can, in fact, if brought ecologically and with the kinds of resources that we need to understand can bring proper irrigation, proper use of water and so on and so forth to communities. Uh, warp space to me is a psychological condition uh, which can be uh, easily understood to exist in the mind as a mental projection in any kind of space, perspectival or otherwise. And cybernetic space can also be perspectival as well as twirling and whirling as you talk about. And I just don't want to be trapped in space. I want to be given liberty in space to, to form my own culture in my own ecological habitat without destroying the rest of the world's habitat and at the same time sustaining myself and my community in a reasonable level of life. Yes. Uh oh. <laughs> it's a classicist in the front row. <laughs> um, I've always thought of Plato as producing more of a metaphor than a prescription. Right. But the sca oh sorry. The scary thing is that he actually thought he could do it. He right. went over to Sicily to try to educate right. a tyrant. Well, the wars is another is another kind of dialogue, right? It's more like a. Um, a prescriptive um, set of, of structures that in one way or another uh, are to be initiated in a almost a kind of neo-colonial version of Greek colonialism, right? So from Miletus to the laws, I think there's a, there's a kind of leap which he's transforming into a kind of rule system. Right. As a result of failed attempts actually yes. to create a utopia in Sicily. Exactly. Or, yeah. And also I think as a result of um, you know, there's that wonderful moment in uh, um, Aristophanes' Birds where, where the geometer Meton comes in and they say, who are you? He says, I'm a geometer, I'm about to de design your city. And they say, how? Well, I'm going to do it by, by, by taking a circle and squaring it and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that urbanistically the problem that Plato has, and this is only something that has sort of recently occurred to me, and I may be completely wrong, but urbanistically the problem that Plato has is that he is developing a model of an archaic centralized circle 
of a city, you know, based on mythical projections of uh, proto-Athens and Atlantis that he develops in the Timaeus and the Critias, um, opposed to that kind of uh, open-ended, open, open sort of grid uh, of the hippodamuses of this world who have begun uh, long before Hippodamus to colonize and to develop cities that because they are colonizing cities in fact have no relation to that kind of stability, that sort of hearth, that sort of ritualistic uh, uh, familial structure that he so hankers after in the old Athens. So to square the circle, you know, is the kind of, uh, is putting in a funny kind of way uh, Plato against Hippodamus and I'm also very interested in the fact that Socrates tries to invent the circular city in the Republic right in the middle of the newly gridded Piraeus, you know, where he's stopped from going back to Athens uh, on the way back from the festival that he goes, which is a new modernizing festival that, that has just been invented and imported. And so this whole archaic imaginary of the Republic, the city of the Republic is somehow, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's as if Filarete was stranded in Garnier's Cité Industrielle and, you know, was trying desperately to make a center out of it, you know. And I think it's very interesting that the modernist um, attempts at developing uh, the ideal city are gridded, are open. I mean, from Otto Wagner through to Hildesheimer, the Corbusier. Corbusier tries always to con constrain it within the figure, metaphorically, of a human structure, a human form. But in s even so, it's, it's gridded, right? And so the, the relationship between the circle and the, uh, and the grid, I think, is, mm. is very important there. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. Yes, and, and just asking who who else has a question? Can I have a question? Yes, yeah. could, could we bring it here? Um, I, w I was involved in uh, Ideal, you dropped your gloves, in uh, a utopian city which was uh, uh, evolved in, uh, it was when Milton Keynes was being planned, I think that the grid that was being set up was intended as a game right. that people could join in and play uh, the problem is that the grid, uh, the people who played the game were the traffic engineers and right. the estates department. Ha ha ha. And uh, that left everybody else out. And that's being reinvestigated now, I think. But I think uh, my, what, what you say about the, the ideal city and the, and the search for form and, and games to play um, and, the, and the understanding of the mechanisms, the, uh, you know, the, the social and implementational mechanisms that people who are actually going to play and, the, and how that is going to be done, um, that, that there's, there's a lot of discontinuity between uh, some of us who are working in some more physical ways, should we right. say, and the people who are working in more financial and governmental structures, right. and uh, which sounds like uh, the platonic gap that's opened up there. Do you s how do you see... Um, uh, some fruitful progress there. Well, I mean, I think in a certain kind of way the process has to start in school, um, start in architecture school. And I think um, one of the ways that we always, um, well, let's see, you've just been through the RIBA accreditation process, right? And so I, I imagine that many of the interlocutors who come in as the team who investigate whether this school could be accredited, just like the ones that uh, you know, descend on schools in the United States, are interested in seeing uh, uh, products from the, from the student studios that have a kind of uh, semi-realizable, realizable, synthetic relationship between you know, program, technology, and form, and that somehow uh, the uh, the architect is supposed to produce products. I think the architect is is much more useful to society if the architect produces ideas, experiments, and processes as opposed to products. Um, I think that products can be extremely inventive and experimental. I mean, I showed the critical of, uh, of Mike Webb, and I showed the kind of... Uh, uh, infrastructure of the computer city that, that uh, Dennis Prompton did in, uh, for Archigram. I think products could be extraordinarily exciting and inventive if they are, to a certain extent, pushing the limits of, of the possible and are of a scale to, in a sense, be manipulated as opposed to manipulate. And so I think 
networks and infrastructure can, can be manipulated. And I think that small scale you know, operations can also be manipulated and controlled. Um, I think that, that what cannot be controlled is, uh, if you like, a product that is solely dedicated to a spectacular consumer use, because that is uncontrollable. You can either buy it or not buy it, but it is there to, in a sense, advertise itself as a product as opposed to something you can enter into, manipulate, and, and, and reorganize in a certain kind of way. I, I just wanted to say, like, like jazz is a, is a structural form that a few yeah. individuals can play. We, we understand that, but, right. but the, stru the, the, the structural form of cities uh, isn't something that we can play you know, so easily, really. Right. No, I understand that, except there are certain, you know, uh, we were reminded this morning in the, in the seminar by uh, Anthony Gormley, who, who pointed out that one of the, um, the cities that in a sense came out um, quite well in the analysis of the Venice Biennale was Bogota, because it had experimented in delivering a certain kind of infrastructure, both virtual and real, and allowed for certain attachments to that infrastructure, which after all was the Archigram ideal in, in its most metaphorical state, the plug-in ideal. Um, I, I, th I think that there are ways of conceiving of and delivering infrastructure at different scales and different levels, but I think what's not been part of our inquiry as architects is um, an understanding of the systems within which, um, you know, uh, we have to insert these uh, infrastructures, either social or, um, in a very funda way, fundamental way, ecological. I mean, we all sort of slightly wondered about the sort of echistics movement in the 70s, right? But if you read some of the work of, uh, of uh, some of Doxiadis' research assistants and so on and so forth, you will see a blueprint for the understanding of an environment that still now has not yet been integrated and understood as an architectural problem. And I don't think architectural problems are simply that of building objects in space with materials. I mean, I give us an example for um, a, uh, an exercise which we carried out in one of my seminars at Cooper where I, where I gave the students the, um, the task of, of just taking one of the, um, one of the panels, um, the titanium panels on the roof of, uh, of Bilbao the Museum of Bilbao. Uh, I wanted to find out where it came from, where it was mined, uh, what happened to it after it was mined. I wanted them to find out what the conditions of the mining communities were in the place, whether the profit went back to those mining communities or whether the environment was just left as a scar. I wanted them to find out how much energy was used in transferring the titanium and remaking and recutting and so on and so forth until it came to the site. I wanted to, them to understand how much labor was quote unquote saved or laid off in relationship to the development of that particular panel and so on and so forth. I wanted them to understand the ecology of a titanium panel as it came to a building site. To understand that the choice of one single material is a choice laden with moral and, uh, and ethical um, uh, weight and that at a certain point we choose materials. We select the, uh, the, the, the site. We understand the energy that we consume. It's not just a matter anymore of green building. It's a matter of understanding a whole range of systems that interconnect in a networked way and making those choices, we're going to have to make them and they're not going to be perfect, but we're going to have to make them with the knowledge of the implications we make them. And, uh, and I think that schools are exactly the place to learn that knowledge. And uh, I myself am dedicated at Cooper to developing a school where that knowledge is sought, even if we don't get answers to all the different multiple and complex equations. Because the answers in the end are political, social and economic. And you, take, you make your political choices, you make your social choices, you make your economic choices, and you are an architect who has to make those ethical choices. And hey, that's school. particularly in the current, the, the kind of current political climate 
the way in which things are named and not named. And so, you, yes. you know, you alluded to the kind of uh, the aversion towards uh, uh, fessing up that it's civil, civil war. war question, yes. And so uh, I'm also thinking about something like the, the export, let's say, of something like democracy yes. by the neocons could be um, could be if they they could have used the word utopia maybe in the privacy of the oval office the word utopia may have come up i i, I don't know um, but my point is that one of the um, one of the one of the ways in which utopia um, becomes you know almost irredeemably problematic is it's kind of totalizing nature. Yes. That, that one man's utopia is another man's civil war, right. as it were. And so I'm wondering to what extent <laughs> are you utopian to believe in you, the, the redeemability of something like ut utopia, given its extraordinarily kind of troubling and fractious kind of history right. of, of, of one totalization well, versus another. As I'm, well. I'm, I'm willing to jettison the term in relationship to the strategy that I'm trying to outline. There's no question. I think the only use of re maintaining the term while we argue strategies is to both understand the complexity of the, of the argument in relationship to what has been to understand the pitfalls that a quote-unquote totalizing vision can get us into, and not so much just the, the big pitfalls, but also the complex small pitfalls. Um, in the same way that you know, one of the things that uh, is interesting about the Platonic discourses is the question that you, know, you, 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 you make a proposition, you follow it a certain, down a certain road, and then that proposition is, to a certain sense, abandoned when you get to where you don't want to get. You know, I, you know, eradicating questions of what Plato actually wanted or what Socrates actually wanted, but the, 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 the structure of the discourse itself, right, I think is, is worthy of interrogating. So I think that, that there are a number of things that um, uh, we can do retaining the word in order to interrogate what that word has, has led to and has meant. On the other hand, the kind of question that we're facing, the kind of question that I raised even with the titanium roof, is a kind of totalization. It's a partial totalization, right? But I think it's totalizing not in form, but in knowledge. And it's, it's totalizing in terms of um, you know, a kind of provisional it's a provisional totalization of a network, and, and that intersects with other networks, right? Which intersects with other networks, right? So everything from the funding conditions of the World Bank to the political conditions of where the, where the mining took place to the, and so on and so forth, intersect in that set of uh, parameters that brings us that panel to that building. Um, that's where I think utopia, as say Ernst Bloch would have would have characterized it as a, as a sense or just a spirit, a sense of the possibility of hope, right? It, it's a provisional totalization always, but I think that the totalization part should not be dropped because otherwise we're in endless empiricism of, uh, yes, that little experiment's great, that little experiment's great, that big experiment, you know, works and, and, and so on and so forth. And we're not joining the dots or connecting our knowledge um, in a fundamental way. So I, I'm, I'm, I, it's almost a strategy to hold to the term, even though, because it's a hateful term, right? And at the same time, it's a term of hope. So that is, I think, if you like, it's, uh, it's like the divided city. You have to have, you know, marriage and, 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 and procreation to produce soldiers. And you have to have soldiers to defend the city, right? The two have to be thought together but are absolutely incommensurable in relationship to their ethical status in the city, right? So utopia, I think, is the same kind of, of divided concept, which we then have to unpack and make strategic as opposed to make form. That, I mean, that's how I would um, propose that. Yes? Um, I was wondering how far uh, you see, um, like, the planner, the person who creates the utopia as an architect or as an artist. 
um, because we've seen so many images and for example Wright has spent m many thousands and thousands of hours on his models and there's so many drawings and I'm wondering, you know, whether... Architect, whether artist, we, writer. We show in space I, I'm not space. a disciplinary um, cat. I, you know, I'm not wedded to particular disciplines. The discipline mm -hmm. of, of, of strategizing existence is a, is a multi and plural... Uh, I don't like interdisciplinarity and I don't like disciplinarity. I, I think that the, 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 the tools come, from the qu come because the questions are asked in particular ways. And then, in sense, the approaches and the, and the and the methods can come from any of a number of existing dis disciplines, so to speak, in the in the fields of, of the environment, or not. They can come from an artistic stroke. So I, I, that I'm not. I, I I don't care who invents it as long as they invent it. <laughs> right? I mean, it could be a politician, but I doubt it. <laughs> One has the spirit of hope there. Thank you very much.